My name is Michelle Johnson. I'm a professor here in the biology department, and um, I've had the, the privilege of working with uh, our two speakers today for the last three years. Um, they are uh, Miguel Angel Weber and Maria Alejandra Jaramillo, and they have a lot in common, and I want to tell you some of the things that these guys have in common. Um, first, uh, they both began their research early in their careers at Trinity. They both uh, started working in the chemistry department uh, the summers after their first years here, and for some reason, immediately after one summer with Miguel and Maria, those professors retired and left Trinity. I'm sure this had <laughs> nothing to do with them, uh, but uh, in their sophomore years, I recruited both of them to come into my lab. Um, also, these are both accomplished musicians. Maria plays the clarinet in the wind ensemble, and Miguel plays the trombone in the jazz band. And finally, they've both gotten me out of a number of international legal scrapes, but also they've gotten me into some, too. Um, so if you'd like to hear those stories, I invite you all to come and join us at Tycoon Flats right after this um, presentation. So at 5.15, we're going to meet at Tycoon Flats for a reception. Uh, drinks are on you, but appetizers on, on us. Uh, so please, I hope you can join us. All right, now uh, we had planned for Maria to go first, but while she is uh, putting her talk back together, <laughs> uh, Miguel is actually going to present first. So I've got to skip some, uh, some slides here in my introduction of Miguel. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right. So our first presentation is by Miguel Weber, a biology major with biomath and chemistry minors uh, who comes to us from Mexico City. Miguel is a mock fellow and he's the recipient of the 2017 Biology Department Senior Award. He's worked on two major projects in the lab, a study of blood physiology that's not part of his thesis and the thesis work he'll tell you about today. And Miguel is a whiz at statistics and coding, and he's also a connoisseur of coffee. He even roasts his own beans. And uh, even if the rest of us didn't notice, uh, he's really revolutionized the sophistication of coffee consumption in our lab. <laughs> Miguel's presented his research at the Texas Herpetological Society and at meetings of the Society of Integrative and Comparative Biology last year in Portland, Oregon, and this year in New Orleans. Now, even though Miguel has made some questionable fashion choices <laughs> over the years, he's clearly a leader in our lab group. Everyone follows him, you see. And sometimes the others even put him on a pedestal. <laughs> but always, safety first. So Miguel's project has required that he learn extensive image and data analysis techniques, and he's collected a huge amount of data in the field, sometimes spending all night looking for lizards in the forests of the Dominican Republic, and the lab, sometimes spending most of the night with the confocal. In fact, maybe this is why he needs so much coffee. But this summer, Miguel will be beginning the Masters of Teachers program at Trinity, for which he's received a generous scholarship. So soon he'll be educating the next generation of scientists and mathematicians. So please welcome Miguel, who will tell you about the evolution of androgen receptor expression and social behavior in anolis lizards. Thanks, Dr. Johnson, for the kind introduction. Thank you all for being here today. I'm excited to tell you about the work that's consumed my last three years at Trinity. Hormones are signaling molecules, and amongst the wells of signaling molecules that there are out there, some of the most important ones are steroid hormones. And within steroid hormones, we have the so-called male hormones, or androgens. And one of the most prominent out there you've probably heard of is testosterone. Testosterone is a little molecule that can bind to a protein called androgen receptor to provoke changes in gene expression when it, this testosterone androgen receptor complex binds to DNA. What can that do? Well, androgens can then influence social behavior through androgen receptor in copulation, aggressive displays, mating displays, and plain old advertisement displays. And no lizards are 
great study system to do this in because we have a huge diversity of species which facilitates comparative work. We have a wide body of literature to both base our research on and build upon, and they're easy to observe in the field. <laughs> so the first of the behaviors I observed is dewlapping. So anoles use the dewlap to communicate with other lizards, and something very cool about the dewlap is that a single muscle controls it. When the serratohyoid, highlighted here in red, contracts, it extends these cartilages running down the middle of the anole's head into performing that beautiful extension you see there. The second of the behaviors we're looking at today is copulation. So, fun fact, anoles actually have two hemipenes and they use either one to copulate. After copulation, where they avert the hemipene to copulate with a female, they have to revert, return the hemipene back where it came from and they use a muscle highlighted here in red called the retractor penis magnus to do that. That means that every single time an anole lizard copulates, it has to use this retractor penis magnus or RPM to do so. We know that androgens affect both of these systems, so dewlap displays are androgen dependent. We know that when you castrate a lizard and therefore remove its source of testosterone, display decreases dramatically. And even cooler, when you implant testosterone into the lizard, those displays reappear. Copulation is similarly androgen dependent and castration also makes lizards stop copulating. When you add a testosterone implant into the mix, copulation reappears. Another cool fact is circulating testosterone actually increases dramatically during the mating season when lizards need both these courtship and territorial displays and copulation itself. We know circulating androgen levels vary across the null species. So in a study Husack and Lovren performed on 18 species of anoles in the Greater Antilles, we hypothesized, well, can differences in the circulating androgen explain differences in behavior across these 18 species of lizard? And because display behaviors and copulation behaviors are both androgen dependent, we thought the answer would be yes, but Circulating testosterone does not fully explain differences in behavior, so there has to be something in between those, and if you'll recall from that first slide, we think that can be androgen receptor. We know androgen receptor affects anole behavior. We know androgen receptor in the brain is associated with reproductive behavior. We know that androgen receptor is expressed both in the serratohyoid, which controls dewlap extension, and the retractor penis magnus, which is used every time the lizards copulate. And we know that androgen receptor expression in the kidneys, which are an accessory sexual gland in lizards, predict behavior better than circulating testosterone does. So we can ask the question in the study, does the evolution of androgen receptor modulate testosterone's effect on behavior? In order to do that, I looked at six species in the Dominican Republic. Two in the trunk crown ecomorph, two in the trunk ecomorph, and two in the trunk ground ecomorph. Now, in brief, ecomorphology is the idea that anole ecology evolves in tandem with anole morphology. So within these pairs of species, again, trunk crown, trunk, and trunk ground, we have lizards that are matched for size, limb morphology, habitat use, and sexual size dimorphism. So when we're looking at our hypothesis, we can look at it not just at the level of all of these six species, but within each of these pairs, looking again at the trunk pair, the trunk ground pair, and the trunk crown pair, which lets us ask the more specific question, within ecomorph pairs, is behavior associated with androgen receptor expression in the muscles that exert it? So for a brief overview of my methods, I first went to the field and quantified behavior for six species from the Dominican Republic. I captured adult males in the same field sites I observed them in, and I sectioned jaw and tail tissue which contained the serratohyoid and retractor penis magnus respectively. I sectioned 10 individuals for each species. And then there was a task of finding androgen receptors. So we first use a molecule called DAPI which binds to DNA and you can see here in blue locating the cell nuclei <coughs> within the tissues. Seen here is a retractor penis <coughs> magnus tissue from Anolis disticus. We then use a primary antibody, PG21, to bind to androgen receptor, a secondary antibody that can bind to PG21, 
and a fluorophore, AF594, that can bind to that secondary antibody and glow bright red when looked at under a confocal microscope. So how do we quantify AR? Well, I used ImageJ to write a macro that can find nuclei in these and then look within each of these nuclei and say, well, how much androgen receptor is really in each of these nuclei? And that's through a measure of integrated density, which combines both how big a nuclei is and how bright it's glowing under the microscope to tell us how much androgen receptor is being expressed there. So I have here a slide with my control. So you can see that when we don't add our primary antibody, PG21, there is no red. When we pre-absorb PG21 with purified androgen receptor protein, we see that that saturates that primary antibody, meaning we see no binding and therefore no red in our assay. And finally, our normal condition where we perform the steps I outlined earlier and we can locate <coughs> cell nuclei in blue, which again appear in all of these, and androgen receptor in red. So what did we find? First, we found that species vary both in their display behavior and their copulatory behavior. Now, across the rest of my slides, you'll see that trunk crown lizards are labeled in green, trunk lizards are labeled in purple, and trunk crown lizards are labeled in orange. And instantly, you'll see that within each ecomorph, pairs of lizards differ both in their display behavior and their copulatory behavior. So is this variation associated with androgen receptor expression? To answer that, first we have to ask, does androgen receptor expression vary at all across these lizards? And well, we actually found so much variation in androgen receptor expression within each species that it's hard to see if that behavior varies across species. So despite there being a lot of variation, that variation is not evident across species, as you can see in this graph. But if we assume the means for androgen receptor expression in the ceratohyoid are biologically meaningful, we can ask, are those related to the behavioral means? So. In this graph, we can see dewlap extensions per minute. That is, how much do lizards dewlap across the x-axis? And androgen receptor expression in the ceratohyoid, which controls dewlap extension on the y-axis. And we found a marginally significant association between the two, suggesting that lizards that dewlap more have more androgen receptor e expressed in the muscle that controls it. We then looked at the retractor penis magnus, where we did find significant variation in androgen receptor expression, both within ecomorph pairs and across species. However, when we looked at an androgen receptor expression in the retractor penis magnus and copulation rate, we found no relationship between the two. So that led us to ask if it's not copulatory behavior, what could it be? The first of our questions consisted of evolutionary history. Does evolutionary history constrain androgen receptor expression? In this phylogeny, we see that these species are hierarchically related. That is, some species, some pairs of species are more closely related than others. So if these species differ in their rates of androgen receptor expression, that could be a result of evolutionary constraint rather than behavioral differences. I used Blomberg's K as a measure of phylogenetic signal, that is, evolutionary constraint, and found no significant phylogenetic signal for either the ceratohyoid or the retractor penis magnus. Next possibility consisted of control in the two muscles. So if a single factor were to control androgen receptor expression in both of these muscles, we'd see some sort of association in androgen receptor expression between the two of them. But in this graph where we have ceratohyoid expression on the y-axis and retractor penis magnus AR expression on the x-axis, we see no association of the two. So androgen receptor seems to be controlled independently in these two muscles. And what we're seeing here are graphs of the proportion of error to the mean of androgen receptor expression, both in the ceratohyoid on the left and the retractor penis magnus on the right. And what's immediately apparent is that there's more variation in the retractor penis magnus than the ceratohyoid. This actually matches the variation we that's reported in a previous study, and that study was just on Anolis carolinensis, a species that was not included in the study, but they found a, very, a proportion of error to the mean of 13% in the ceratohyoid, again, proportional with what we found, and 19.2% in the retractor penis magnus, again, suggesting that if there's more variation in one muscle, that might be controlled by different factors. We found the same 
association between androgen receptor expression in the ceratohyoid and the dewlap that the ceratohyoid controls. And this is display behavior. So we found that variation in display behavior was associated with variation in androgen receptor expression in the muscle that controlled it. And that's actually the same pattern that another study found. Fu, Fu Yeager et al. in two, 2015 looked at birds. And what he found in birds was that birds that had more complex wing movements for social displays and therefore used those muscles more had more androgen receptor expressed in those muscles. And circulating testosterone may actually play a role here too. So Husak and Lovern, the same study that tried to find a relationship between circulating testosterone behavior earlier, and we took those values for circulating testosterone and tried to relate them to our values for androgen receptor expression. And what we immediately found is that these levels are roughly associated. So we see in both of our studies that the species with higher circulating testosterone may have higher androgen receptor expression. And another paper, Holmes and Wade 2005, found that testosterone can increase androgen receptor in the retractor penis magnus, but not the ceratohyoid. So what does this all mean? <laughs> This is actually only the second comparative study looking at steroid hormone receptors and behavior, at least to my knowledge. And this study supports the idea that different forces influence androgen receptor expression in different muscles. What those forces may be is unclear, but we think it might just be display behavior for the ceratohyoid, which again exerts those display behaviors, and circulating testosterone for the retractor penis magnus. So, this is just the work of my, of my senior thesis, but we're continuing this kind of work in the Johnson lab, and we're actually looking at 29 species total, 22 species total, to try and see if these patterns hold up across a larger group of species, or if they disappear. But I'd like to thank my funding sources, the National Founding Science Foundation, my mock fellowship, and Cary Wildlife Preserves, as well as uh, many, many people who were very instrumental in the production of the thesis work. I'd like to thank Dr. Michelle Johnson, Dr. Gerard Bodwin, Dr. Jonathan King, and Dr. James Roberts, Brittany Ivanoff, Murray Harmillo, Ariel Carl Face Deckard, Adam Zeb, Leah Selsnick, Jake Sturkula, Claudia Garcia, Amy Payne, Marzia Ruzvani, and Jesus Vega. And with that, I'll take any questions. Every time the loser dewlaps, it's contracting the ceratohyoid. And with the retractor penis magnus, every time the loser copulates, it has to retract that hemipene back into its body with the retractor penis magnus, which means that if we're looking at muscles that are associated with behavior, it really doesn't get better than these two. What yeah. did you discover that made you curious about something you'd want to do more with this? Well, it's really interesting that display behavior, which happens far more frequently than copulation, is the one we found a possible relationship for. So it may just be that because lizards do lap so much more than they copulate, that relationship is less subtle. But it's a really uncharted waters at this point, and that's just cool. <laughs> Yes. Sort of in the middle of, of your circulating testosterone versus uh, versus receptor is um, that when receptor doesn't bind testosterone, it doesn't also locate the nucleus. Yes. If you look at all at the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio of your receptor uh, in your images. No, but that's actually next in our list of future directions for the studies. We have all the images for the study quantified, and so we can take a look back and see well, can we distinguish between nuclei, androgen receptor in the nuclei, and androgen receptor in the cytoplasm, then furthermore, between androgen receptor in nuclei inside the muscle fibers and outside the muscle fibers, but that's something that's coming up. Yes, Dr. King. 
Do these species uh, breed all year round, or are they, are they restricted to a particular season? And then to follow up, do you have tissue from when they're maybe in the non-breeding season to look at the ratio of antireceptor to, in the cytoplasm? So these, these lizards are all seasonal breeders. They all breed in the summer. And all the tissues as well as all the behaviors we recorded are from that summer breeding season as to whether we have non-breeding season tissue in the lab. I believe we don't, but could be a future direction. I believe that when I believe when Holmes and Wade looked at seasonal effects of androgen receptor expression, at least in Anolis carolinensis, they found none. And they found that androgen receptor expression in both of these muscles did not change with Breathing season. All right, thank you very much.